now I'd like to bring Lucas up and um, introduce Lucas. So here we go. Lucas, hey, welcome to EdgeChat Interactive. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, like many of the users, are am getting used to the Shindig platform too, so, so no one should feel bad. Um, well, good. Well, I know that, that you've planned a, a pretty interactive session for this evening. So I'll bring myself down, and then at different points, you can you can ask me to come up, and we can discuss some of the points that you bring up, um, and or bring some of the people who are here. Uh, we're going to be recording this, so um, so people do not have to take notes. And in fact, um, this will be posted on on our website, so that um, people who have missed tonight will be able to catch it as well. So I'll bring myself down, and I'll bring your your slides up. Thanks. And I guess uh, uh, you you control the slides, right, Mitch? So I'm saying uh, next, I guess. I think that's the case. Cool. So uh, yeah, th uh, thanks. Uh, uh, th thanks everyone for for attending. Um, so yeah, we're going to be talking about applying game design principles um, to improve, you know, learner student engagement. Um, so uh, before we get started, I just uh, and, and Mitch has already uh, shared some of my bio. So yeah, I'm a, a game designer uh, at Little Bird Games, one of the co-founders. Um, been designing games for uh, about seven, eight years now. Um, and uh, the company makes educational and therapeutic games. Uh, we use some healthcare training. Uh, we also make uh, online courses and build a lot of badge and achievement systems. Um, so yeah, and uh, next slide. So today, the three principles that we're going to cover are uh, goal setting, feedback, and challenge. Um, because of the, the format today and because of the limited time that we have, uh, those are kind of the three that we picked. There, uh, there are a lot of other game design or, or just design principles in general that are, that are very important um, you know, for, for education. Um, but, but these are you know, three, of the, three of the big ones or, or three of the biggest ones. So uh, we decided to cover these. So it's, yeah, goal setting, feedback, and challenge is what we'll be talking about today. Um, and uh, you can go to the next uh, slide, Mitch. And um, to be clear, I guess, before I go to this one, the way that you know, today is going to kind of flow is I'm going to essentially cover something, cover a topic, show some examples, talk about how I've seen it implemented into classrooms or training or things like that, so outside of games. So the examples I'm going to show you are from games. Um, and then we're going to have everybody kind of either 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 work on some ideas or, or discuss or share some thoughts they might have on it. So it's it's a, a collaborative kind of uh, an environment, which which Mitch had uh, mentioned earlier. Um, so I guess, uh, but before we dive in, so one of the questions that people uh, often ask about this kind of thing is: Is this gamification? And um, all of you are probably familiar with that term. I would. Um, say no, it is not gamification. Um, other people would disagree, um, and they are they are uh, welcome to do that. The reason I say that is because the the principles that we're going to talk about are universal to design. I think uh, the and I, and I want to just want to say that like you know the examples that I'm going to show are from games because I'm a game designer. Um, so it makes sense that that's what I would bring. But what we're going to try, you know, uh, what I want you guys to to take away from this is thinking about those three principles and, and, and seeing the game examples, but then putting them in your own context and not necessarily feeling obligated to take something out of a game, hold just out and then plop it down into whatever you're trying to do. So, which is oftentimes, uh, not always, but, but sometimes what people do when they think about gamification or when I think about gamification. So that's not the intention. So I want everybody to focus on the principles first and then, you know, then look at the examples, and then try to figure out ways that you could incorporate that those things into into your work. So uh, next uh, next slide, Mitch. Cool. So so the 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 first the first principle is goal setting, and and as I said earlier, uh, these principles are kind of universal. Now these are definitely big things that we think about when we're designing games, but you know goal setting is also something that you know anybody that's ever made a piece of curriculum or anybody that's ever made a piece of training. They, they, they think about this, or they should at least. Um, so, so goal setting is essentially, you know, in games, it's the player being able to 
look ahead either in the short term or in the long term and say, I want to accomplish this thing or I want to be this person, which happens sometime in games, right? So the, the goal setting is about how your character or potentially you will, will turn into something else. Um, it accomplishes a couple different things. I mean, first, it, it, it gives people a reason to get through content, right? Um, you know, a lot of times, and, it, and not all games are always fun. Uh, there, there are some games where people are, they kind of trudge through content. They grind, I believe, is the term that is used in a lot of games. Um, and they do that because they have some bigger goal in mind or some other thing they want to accomplish that is, you know, greater than the task at hand. So they're willing to, you know, and, you know, I, I think that happens in education all the time, right? You, you go through classes you don't like because you want to graduate or because you want a diploma or because you want to get a good grade. Um, I don't know, I don't, I, I'm not advocating that we use any of these principles like goal setting to trick people into doing stuff, but I think being aware of the reasons that people stick with things when they're maybe not liking it, I think it's important when you're designing a system um, or a piece of curriculum or anything like that. Um, the other thing about goals is that uh, in terms of what it what it accomplishes is it also gives it gives the player or it gives the learner a sense of what is important to you as the designer the goals that you make available to them because you know by, by virtue of you making them available um, you're saying that this is important this is a good thing this is available in the system this is something that you can do um, and it's something that because people are always trying to establish like what is what is right and what is wrong in this particular environment, what is correct and what should I... So by making those goals, you know, available up front, then, you know, you're, you're, you're saying that this is, this is something that, that we in this course or this game or this community or whatever we value. Um, so, so the best practices, and this is just a, um, a list of a couple things that I think about. So it, it's important to make the distinction between short-term and long-term goals. Um, it, you want to have a mix of both because people should feel, you know, for, for players or learners to feel accomplished or to feel rewarded, they, they're, they're, there's kind of a cadence to uh, how how quickly they're, and uh, Mitch, if you could go back to the uh, the previous slide uh, for, for a moment. Um, there, there, there's a, the way at which they complete goals um, is, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, it's it's dictated by by how you space them out. Uh, Mitch, if you could go to the previous slide, uh, the one that we were on before. Uh, might have, oh, there we go. Cool. So so yeah. So that's that mix of short term and long term goals. Like you don't want to have all long term goals because it would take people forever to accomplish them. Uh, so you want to have kind of a mix, some short term goals that lead up to to longer term goals. Um, you, you want them to be self selected. So you don't want to give someone their goals. Do you want them to self-select their own goals. So you say, here's a bunch of stuff you can they say, oh cool, I want to do this, this, and this. Um, and, and potentially they could be self-created depending on the flexibility of your system. Um, having people create their own goals would be pretty cool too. Um, not always possible, but it's something we, we, we strive for. Um, they should be discoverable, they should be visual. You cannot set a goal if you are not aware of it. So people should be very aware of the goals and I like to make things um, visual. It just makes it easier for people to understand it. Um, you should have lots of options, so if you have like one goal and then they're like, choose, uh, it kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, so the more that you can have, the better. Uh, I, I think it's a way to give players or learners agency, so that's always something that you want to try to do. Um, I, and this is a best practices according to me, so, um, so take this with, a, I guess, a grain of salt, but I, I try to make them private. Uh, certainly the selection and earning of the goals unless the earner decides to share. So somebody may not want everyone in the community or in the game to know I'm going, I'm trying to do this thing, or I haven't done it because I failed. Um, so we try to leave those things up to the, when you can, up to, up to the earner to decide if they want to share it so they can kind of craft their own identity. Um, and and uh, finally, the, the most important thing is you really want, not the most important, but like a really very important thing, you want to clearly define the criteria of completing a goal. Um, because you know, it, it makes people able to, you know, accomplish it. They have to know, they have to know what they're striving for, what they have to achieve in order to, 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 to complete the goal. So the, the criteria, the, the, the things that we measure them by have to be pretty clearly defined. 
Um, so, uh, Mitch, if you could go to the next slide, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll talk about some examples and games. Um, so, so one of the first ones is achievements and badges. I have both of them in there. So badges is a, a, a term that's uh, pretty popular in education now. Everybody uh, or a lot of places are trying to put uh, digital badges into things. Um, the video game equivalent of that is achievements. So there have been achievements in games for a pretty long time. Um, longer than there have been badges. Um, so if anybody's not familiar with either of those terms, so it's the, the idea of an achievement or a badge is you know, essentially in a game, you can, there, there are certain things that are either milestones that, you know, it's impressive that you got to this point, um, uh, or, or they could be things that are very unique or very challenging, a true achievement in the sense that, like, you know, out of all the players, maybe only a small percentage would actually achieve them. Um, we use these in, in games and education stuff a lot. I think they're, they're great because they meet a lot of the criteria from the previous slide. They're very visual. They're very, um, the criteria are very, very clearly defined. Um, you can, you can, they can build on one another. You can put them in, if anybody's ever seen, so like the, the image on the left there, that's from Diablo. And you can see that those are in a particular order and there are lots of achievements in Diablo and in game, you know, in other games, some, some have hundreds or thousands of achievements. Um, but they're in a particular order, right? They, they, they let the players know, or, or the learner, depending on the situation, uh, you know, at what order should I approach these things in? They're not going to go for something that's completely, completely insane and really difficult in, initially. They'll probably try to do something that um, is a little less difficult and, and kind of lower in there. So those ones in Diablo are in, um, they're in a particular order. Um, and so, so they, they become very useful and, and, you know, and some of the ones on the right there, um, especially the one with the skull and, uh, kind of looks like a, maybe machete crossbones kind of thing going on there. Um, that is from, I, I want to say Halo, although I could be wrong, it's from a first person shooter and, and that particular achievement, at least the visual for it, uh, if somebody in the chat knows, I guess, uh, let me know, but, um, it is very difficult to get, um. Uh, I, I think it's like, you know, out of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of players, like the percentage of people that get it is like a tenth of a percent or a very, very, it's very small. So like if someone has that, then it shows that like they put a lot of work into that and they probably spent a lot of time doing it. Um, and then, so yeah, very popular in education. They're used in kind of the same way, although in... In education, there's, you know, there's a, a lot of times they're, they're used as rewards or it's like a sticker, like, hey, you got a badge, and that's not how you should think about them. You should think about them as, as a goal-setting mechanic. It's a much better way to plan the systems. Uh, uh, Mitch, if you could go to the next, uh, the next slide there. Um, so the next one is a leveling system. So a leveling system is very, very, very common in games. It is a role-playing game, is a role-playing mechanic. So it's uh, something that's... Uh, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't know that I can say where the first leveling occurred, although the first time I can remember, you know, hearing about or seeing is like Dungeons and Dragons, right? Those characters have a clearly defined leveling system. So a level essentially means that your character will, um, as it progresses through a game, um, get better, bigger, have more stuff available to them. And those are called levels. Those are the, the, the increments that we measure those by are called levels. Um, so uh, if, you, if you think about uh, that in terms of education, I guess like the equivalent of that might be something like as you progress through grades or, or in the, you know, maybe, maybe that means in the military as you progress through ranks or something like that, right? Um, but, but so if you look at uh, something like the, the picture on the lower left there, that is from the game Destiny. And so there's, you know, players, when they, when they unlock a new level, uh, they get... They have new stuff available to them. That level um, indicates to other players either how good they are or how advanced they are in a particular game. Um, it gives the players, you know, something to strive for. You want to keep progressing, and it's and that's that's the a leveling system. Um, is earlier I I mentioned the you know, the idea between the split between short term and long term goals. A leveling system tends to be more of it's a series of short term goals, right? I got to get to the next level and the next level and the next level. Um, and those those levels, as I said, they, they, they have more meaning than the number itself. You unlock things um, as you do it. So somebody hits level 20, maybe they have additional items or skills available to them. Um, in the lower right-hand corner there, it says Paragon Level 1. That is from Diablo 3. 
And in Diablo, after you've leveled your character, you know, through the full, I think, like 99 levels or whatever it is, then there are Paragon levels after that. And those Paragon levels are an additional leveling system, and you get attributes for that, right? So those attributes are, you know, more strength, more dexterity, more wisdom for your character. Um, so so the, the, those are uh, an interesting way. You know, anytime somebody moves through a system, uh, it having just little increments that they can say, I'm at this particular place. It's like a mall map. You are here. Um, that's the, the general idea. Um, so uh, Mitch, if you could go to the next thing. So, so the, the, the final one here is quests. And so quests are, are uh, what you would think of in education is maybe like project-based learning, right? It's in a quest, it's in a game, you show up to a place, the universal symbol, uh, for the most part, for quests is someone having an exclamation point above their head, which that uh, the gentleman on the left there has. Um, and that's essentially him saying, uh, hey, I have something for you to do. Um, that something for you to do is a quest that is pictured on the right. This is from World of Warcraft. Um, and, and they basically, it has a name, it has a description, clearly defined criteria of what you have to do. Um, and, and potentially a reward for doing it. In this case, you would get, um, you know, it looks like some piece of equipment um, and also uh, some in-game currency. So, so what you would do then is you would say, okay, I want to pledge to do this. And that's another thing that we always try to build into the systems, some kind of pledge mechanic. You make someone commit to saying, yes, I'm going to do this. The other nice thing about that is it gives you a timestamp. You can know how long it takes people on average to complete the thing. Or if they said they were going to do it and then they give up, um, do they try again? You can you can get some interesting mechanics or uh, interesting uh, metrics from that kind of thing. Um, but so so yeah, so the equivalent of that education might be a you know, project based thing or something like that. Uh, so Mitch, we go to the the next uh, slide there. So in the classroom, some examples of this that I've seen are you know maybe a board that shows students what they can accomplish. Right, that's pretty simple. That's pretty lightweight. No technology involved. But it's saying hey, this is all the things that you can accomplish in this class. And I think it's important. As I said earlier, you don't doesn't mean you have to accomplish all of them. It's like a menu. It's like, hey, here's a bunch of stuff that that you can do. Um, and then I think uh, one of the next ones is creating multiple options for projects. So, uh, like I said earlier, like the more options that you have, um, the better. And then uh, finally, you know, ask students to identify or asking students to identify their own goals for the class. So that's another idea that you can have. Um, so instead of maybe you creating all of the projects or all the all the quests, maybe have the students say, you know, what are, what are your goals for this thing? What would you like to accomplish? And that's, you know, a way to make them feel like they have some agency, but it's also a way for you to kind of survey the class. Maybe they think, maybe they'll think of something cool that you didn't think of. Um, so uh, uh, Mish says that uh, Christopher would like to ask a question. Uh, uh, so can he come up on stage? Uh, yeah, sure. Hi, Lucas. How are you? Hey, Christopher. Hey, doing Christopher. Well. Doing well. I just had a quick question. Um, I've seen a recent trend um, with the importance of grit, uh, measuring grit um, in the classroom, and I see this as potential grit, an opportunity to um, incorporate achievements, rewards, and even system design and game design to effectively measure grit. Have you worked on any games or seen game design in the classroom um, that has been used as such? Uh, yes, so I've actually uh, built a, we had to build a system or design a system that would measure grit and we used um, a badging system for that. And one of the things you knew that, one of the things you needed if you're going to measure grit, and I mentioned this a, a minute ago, is you have to have a pledge mechanic, right? Because it, grit is essentially a measure of the likelihood that you're going to stick with something after failing a couple different times and will you return to it? Will you keep trying to do it? And Unless I have those time stamps, then I there's nothing to measure. But so to actually measure grit, what we do is you so if it's a, if it's a badging thing, if it's a quest system, if it's any of that stuff, projects, it doesn't have to be game related. But so you have to have that pledge that pledge thing. You have to have them say, "I want to do this. I'm setting this goal for myself," and that's a time stamp. Your next time stamp is going to be either when they drop it and say, "I don't want to do this anymore," or when they submit it. And one of two things happens. They meet the criteria and they get it or they fail. And that's when it's really interesting when you're measuring grit because then they fail, then what you want to measure is do they come back and try to submit it again or do they give up? So, so then what your job is to not, ideally as a designer, you don't just want to track it and be like, well, they gave up. 
try to think about ways that you can make them not give up. Are there ways that you can nudge them or remind them or, you know, maybe give them like kind of a helping hand or have somebody else help them out? There's, there's an infinite number of things you can do. Um, but I think, yeah, you're, you're right that like measuring grit with this sort of thing is totally what you should be doing. But it's important that you do something with that information because otherwise you're just, it's like checking a box. You're like, yeah, they gave up. So thank you for the question. Thank you very much. A great answer. I, I guess um, we can kind of decide, uh, uh, Mitch, if you want to give everybody a, a minute or two to, to think about ways that they would want to incorporate this, if anybody wants to uh, come up on the stage or come up on chat or something like or something in chat. Um, yeah, I was, um, you know, as, as you were talking, I was kind of in my mind thinking about the differences between badges and achievements and leveling because they are somewhat related. But, um, you know, trying to come up with, um, you know, I, I guess I was thinking of, of Boy Scouts as an example, where it's, which is not video game related, but, um, but in Boy Scouts, you do pass through different stages of, of Boy Scouts, right? You, you, you're a tenderfoot or you're, you know, you, you're a scout, you're eventually an Eagle Scout, um, and then you also achieve badges that are, you know, some badges may be tied to a different level, but other badges you could get at any level, right? So it, it, it's similar to that in a classroom. The analog version of it, basically, yeah. So the, the military is one of the other examples that we always hear of. There are ranks, but then there are also medals. And and the ranks signify prog your progression through a system, like whatever it is, that's that's levels. And then mm -hmm. the medals, or, or the badges that you referred to, those, those point to specific events. That person was here. That person did this thing. That person accomplished this. Um, so yeah, th those are like analog versions of those things. So they are, they are proven. I, I think that's uh, <laughs> people have been doing that for the military regalia has been around for a long time. And, if, and in my class, what I could do is, is I could think of, um, you know, if I, if I thought of, say, the whole school year, I could think of, well, you know, something in about two months, I think my students should be at about this level. And so I could think of some types of things that they could do so that they could progress to that level and I could name that level. And then after another month or six weeks, I might think that they would be at such and such a level and I could come up with things that they could do to get to that level. And I could construct my whole class that way so that students, you know, got to do some type of showing that they had reached certain level. And in the process, they could also achieve different things and achieve, you know, they could, if they did this product, if they did this project, they would get to achievement. If they did this project and really excelled, then they might get a different achievement. So I could really construct my whole class using this this way of leveling and badges and achievements as a kind of a, a competency-based learning system for my class, right? Sure. And, 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 you know, not all of those things have to be, I mean, I, I'm, I, I like, you want to have as much information available, or I should say enough information available to the students so they understand the system, they see where they're going. But like uh, some of those mm -hmm. things, like some, you could have a leveling system, but maybe never show it to the students, right? Maybe that's just your personal mm -hmm. information about how you think about how students progress through a particular piece of curriculum or a class or whatever. And then when they get to a certain point, you know, okay, it's time to do this. Okay, it's time to do this. I mean, instructors and curriculum developers, they do that now anyway, right? In, in a way, at least you should be. Mm -hmm. so just thinking about it this way right. forces you to really increment along the way and understand that if somebody's at this place and they should be good at this and maybe they'd be interested in doing this next. Um, it's also nice because when you can see students progress through increments like that, then if somebody is lagging behind or if somebody is ahead, it's much easier to pinpoint that and be like, well, they're here and they should be here. Think about why. Or if maybe somebody's really ahead of everybody else, then you have to figure out some place for them to go or something for them to do because uh, you're going to lose them otherwise. So maybe that means looping them back and having mm -hmm. them help people that are at a lower level or, you know, so there's a bunch of different things you can do with it, but. You know, and the other thing that that's now, you know, you're it's, uh, spinning my, my brain a little bit um, is that now that we're approaching summer, it might be a good time if I were, you know, as, as, a, as a teacher to maybe get together with another teacher or two and try mapping that out 
with another yeah. teacher because it's yeah. hard to do if you're doing it alone. But Absolutely. if you can get two or three teachers together, kind of trying to figure it out, it's it's it'd be it'd be a lot easier to set up and 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 probably a better system as as well. Yeah, um, and, and are, you're describing it as mapping I'm, it out. I'm wondering if people are putting into the IM box. They they mm -hmm. are, and I, somebody just popped one in there. There was a question I was going to bring up. Uh, so so Patrick said, uh, gaming has always in my mind been geared uh, uh, for males rather than females. Uh, is my thinking antiquated, and how are girls getting into games? So, um, I mean, I think I, I think if you're thinking about, um, so I guess the short answer to your question is yes, that is antiquated. Um, the long <laughs> answer is. Um, <laughs> I think traditionally, yes. So, so if you're thinking about like you know like arcade arcade games in the 70s and stuff like that, like in the 80s, uh, even even into the 90s, it was very much geared toward the the way the games were designed and especially the way the games were marketed um, was very very much geared towards males. Um, but now the split between male and female, so that if you look at the population of who is a gamer who consumes games, it's about a 50 50 split now. It's it's about a, it's about 50 50 between males and females. Now that's in part due to the fact that yeah, there are certain games that I think that potentially, for whatever reason, appeal to or are, or are played more by males than females. So like, if you take your average first-person shooter, there are probably more males playing that than females. It's not to say there's not a bunch of females playing it too, but percentage-wise, probably more males. But uh, if you look at something like online games, social games, mobile games. The majority of those, I would say, percentage-wise, are probably played by more females than males. So they even out in a way. And I've even heard some people say that, uh, and there's some, I guess, research that would support this, that there are maybe even certain mechanics that, for whatever reason, might appeal more to males or females, you know, versus, and I'm not super well-versed in that, but there's probably some uh, research out there that you could, uh, you could look to. So yeah, Patrick so and taking a scientific Patrick said Candy Crush. So yeah, that's a good example. Right, and taking a scientific survey of your house in your house, fifty percent of the gamers are male and fifty percent are female, right? In my house, oh well, yeah, they are. But that's 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 easy because in it's your in house, so, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You're, I don't know if our sample right. size is is robust enough. We might have to get get a, get a few more. Um, well, it, then we, we'll just make it up. That's okay. So that's perfectly fine. Uh, we're not publishing this, so it doesn't matter. Okay. I can see what you want. Right. It's it's just going to be on the internet. Nobody nobody goes on the internet. It's not. Yeah. So um, yeah, we can uh, we could probably move on. And although, if if people have examples of how um, or questions either examples or questions of how they might use badges or achievements in their how they might use a leveling system in their class it'd sure. be great for them to put into the IM or if they want to share it um, if you can click that hand button you know the button that looks like a hand and uh, let me know then I can bring you up on stage and you can you can talk about it with Lucas uh, in the yeah, so we can start into the next thing and then if somebody raises their hand we can stop and, and pop back to that Okay, so at any point, if you have something that you'd like to come up on stage and share with Le Lucas, uh, click on the hand button, and then um, and th and I'll bring you up. In the meantime, I'll pull myself down and bring your slides back up. Cool. So the next uh, the next principle that we're going to talk about is feedback. Um, so everybody's probably heard of the term feedback, although I think game designers probably think about that in a, maybe a slightly different way than other folks. Um, so feedback is essentially what that graphic on the right there represents. Um, that's from a, a, a Gamma Sutra article. Uh, we, all, we oftentimes we say feedback loop, and I'll explain what that means um, in a second. But well, I guess so that's, that's the feedback loop, right? Something happens, or the player or the learner does something. It has an effect. We give them feedback. They adjust and perform an action, and then so that's the loop, right? And so... That is, that is the what what we try to have people doing, and a feedback loop is one of the requirements for getting people kind of engaged and locked into an experience or, or, or a flow state, if you prefer. Um, so uh, now you're not you're not necessarily thinking about that in educational settings the same way, because in games there's an immediacy, right? There's like there's this rapid like you know the the amount of actions that happen and the amount of effects and the amount of feedback is probably very rapid, um, but 
I think the a lot of the same things that we think about are probably the same things that that somebody in an educational setting should think about. So, the the split between immediate versus delayed feedback, for example. So, if you give somebody feedback instant, you know, right as they're messing something up or right as they get something wrong, versus giving them feedback about whether it was right or wrong, maybe when they're done with it. Um, in games, a lot of times that happens because of the kind of game that it is now, now, or because of the kind of action or because you want to convey with them. So a lot of times if something is very, you know, not going to give somebody a, a summary, a full screen summary of how they're doing while they're still doing it because you're probably going to mess them up, right? So that, those are, that's a delayed feedback kind of thing that happens at the end. But what you will give them is, is maybe some immediate feedback during gameplay like, oh, no, your health is low or somebody's in this direction or this is happening and this is how you should respond. So, you know, the, the equivalent of that in, in an educational thing and, and the way that another way that we think about feedback is that if somebody is a new player or they're not very skilled uh, and in the classroom, maybe they're a new student or they're, they're learning something for the first time, you would give them more immediate feedback because they don't know how they're doing. They don't know if they're doing good or, or bad. They're just doing a thing and hoping no one is mad at them, right? But as somebody gets better at something, it probably makes sense to give them to, to, to space that feedback out more and more and more because we want to ask learners or players or whoever to start to critically self-evaluate their own performance, which is a higher level of learning, right? We want them to start to think about, am I doing this right? What could I do better? How could I, you know? And and so the the rate at which you give feedback, you want to be somewhere, you know, you want to be, you know, you don't want to be annoying, but you also don't want to... Um, make them feel like you've abandoned them, right? So there's, there's some kind of Goldilocks zone in there where it's like, okay, this is useful feedback. I, I can use this. Um, in education, you would probably also make the, the distinction or the difference that you would think of is probably the difference between formative versus summative feedback. Um, so you try to do a little bit of both. Um, and then uh, when possible, I like to try to have feedback come from multiple sources. You know, so in games, maybe that means it's visual and auditory, right? So it's not just you can see something that's happening, a flash or something happening, but maybe maybe a sound happens too. And you do that in education stuff, at least, you know, ed tech, like online platforms and things. Um, but so having feedback come from multiple sources um, is good. I mean, for one thing, because people maybe respond to different feedback from different sources differently. So maybe some people have a preference. Um, and it, it's also a way to, you know, just make it so you're accommodating more people. So maybe somebody uh, can't can't pick up on a visual cue, but they can hear they they'll be able to hear hear the feedback. So um, if we go to the next thing, Mitch, we'll start to look at some uh, examples from games. Um, so oh, so this is a distinction. So I, I make a distinction, but there's two kinds of feedback that I want us to try to think about. So one of them is a, like a score or like some kind of metric. So that answers the question. You know, how am I doing? The player is saying, how am I doing? What's is this good? Is this bad? So you know, ideally you want to give people little goals, and that was the first thing we talked about, little goals or little benchmarks so they can be trying to achieve, trying to do the thing, and that's the feedback that you give them, right? They're, you're, and that's in relation to the criteria that you set forth. So, like, if the goal is to stay alive and your health is getting low, then you would let them know that, right? And they're trying to, you know, um, to accomplish that. And then, you know, when do they advance? Like, how do they – so that's the other thing that they want to know is, like, I'm progressing through this thing um, – how close am I to the next level? How close am I to getting this thing? And you give them feedback on that because you want them to be constantly striving to, you know, to achieve that, and you need feedback in order to do that. Um, they also want to know when, when do they win? When do they finally meet the goal? And you see that we're referencing back to that first principle that we talked about because all these things are very related. Um, so they want to know, like, when do I win? Like, you want them to be, you know, because if you're just doing a thing but you have no idea when you're going to accomplish your goal, then that... Uh, you're, you're going to lose them. They're not going to be engaged anymore. So, so giving them a little bit of information is good. Um, and the other thing to think about is when to, uh, making the score more meaningful. And so do you need a number? So I, 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 we tend to want to quantify everything. And like the number, like having a number is like pretty low-hanging fruit or something like that. But sometimes when we have scores, we make them in, in the context of either the game or of the thing that they're trying to learn. Um, so for example, you, you know, if you're doing something, if you're doing a military simulation, for example, um, we've done this in the past where like the feedback and the score that you would get from based on the decisions that you made or the, or the route that you chose wouldn't be a score. It would be the number of people that you saved or didn't. 
So, so that's still a score, but, but, but in, within the context of that system, that's like people living or people dying, right? So it, it, it's contextually accurate, but it also makes the score mean more, right? So saying 50, that may not mean anything, or it may mean less than saying 50 people, right? So, so I think it's important to think about not only what makes sense within the context of that game or within that, you know, that piece of curriculum, but also what would matter to your players or to your learners. Um, Mitch, you can go to the next thing. So here's just some examples from games. So this is from a first-person shooter. And some of these screens are very busy, right, because they're, they're, they're video games, so there's lots of stuff going on. But there's all kinds of feedback going on here, right, and little feedback loops that would happen. There's a, there's a compass that tells them what direction stuff is in. You can see other players. You can see objects on there. They know that they hit somebody for 30, uh, for 30 damage. They know that they have to reload. Uh, they know where there's other enemies. They can see that they're on a they're on a they're on a seven kill streak. Good for them, uh, and that they can press six to call dogs down upon their enemies. Uh, this is not an educational game, um, and, and so you know there's just a lot of information going on here. You see that it's like certain things have certain colors, and 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 those colors indicate it. So something is green versus red versus yellow. The players cue into that, and they get trained to look for those things. Um, if you go to the next one, Mitch. So and those are all very immediate kind of, right? So there's nothing about that previous one that's about, oh, this we'll talk about this later. This is like right now someone is shooting at you, right? This game is kind of the same way. This is one of the Rock Band games. And the feedback that you get in these things is auditory and that if you mess something up, it'll make the note, the music will sound weird, which is like, you know, what you immediately have is like, oh, like you can hear the, the guitar sound is kind of off. Um, but there's also a visual cue. So like the things will light up if you hit them on time. They won't light up if you don't. Uh, it shows you what is coming. Uh, which is kind of cool, um, and, and so there's all that feedback, and, and it's this is a you know these kind of things are training systems as much as they are games. It trains you to be good at the game. Um, we'll go to the next the next thing there, Mitch. So this is a super busy one. This is from uh, World of Warcraft. This is a custom UI. This is not what chips with the game, but somebody um, did a bunch of stuff in there. But so the um, you know, so this is from a single player's perspective, and all those things that they see are all their teammates' health bars. And so they, this is this particular individual is a is a priest, so they're healing, um, and, and so they have to be very aware of like everybody's health bar. So they're watching like, in this case, maybe like twenty five different little progress bars, seeing like who's gets red or yellow or orange. So then they have to throw them a heal. They also have to be aware of all the stuff that's going on around them. There's you know there's a chat and there's all these other things, and those are all little bits of information, little pieces of feedback. Um, if you go to the next one, Mitch, um, and again, it's one of those things that, you know, this is that those, those previous ones were all immediate feedback. Those are the things that are important to that person in the moment. And that is the information, that is one of the things you should ask yourself. If I give someone this information, what will they do with it? And if it's not part of a feedback loop, if it's not something they can use, don't give it to them. It's not time. You're going to overwhelm them, right? And, and in this case of those games, they're probably already overwhelmed. So this example here, this is from League of Legends, and this is a this is delayed feedback. This is summative feedback, right? So this is at the end of a game. One of the teams won. So uh, basically, the, the, this is an overview of what happened, and, and it's the game saying this player did this and this, this other player did this and this, and and this is how well they did, and this is your score. This is available to everyone. Everyone sees everyone else's stuff, um, and it's a uh, it's an it's an interesting thing. So a lot a lot of games. Um, a lot of games do this that are very like intense. So first-person shooters, MOBAs. This is this is a uh, the the acronym is a uh, uh, multiplayer online battle arena or MOBA. So sorry for the the jargon there. Um, but so yeah, it's um it, this is a kind of summative feedback, and you can see that the players can chat, they can talk about it. Usually they talk trash to one another, but in an educational setting, I like to think that people would be a little bit more uh, a little nicer to each other. Um, Mitch, you can go to the next one there. And so, so this is another example of a summative feedback kind of thing. This is from Counter-Strike. Same deal. It tells you who won, tells you how everybody did. Um, and then this is where, again, the trash talking occurs. Uh, you can go to the next one, Mitch. Uh, and so the other kind of feedback is instructional feedback. And that's things like tooltips for the interface. That's hints on strategy. That's telling somebody, you know, specifically how they failed or how to do better. So... Um, you know, one of the examples, uh, the lower right there, it says, uh, why not heat things up a bit and shoot this element uh, to, so it's giving you a hint, right? So my guess is the, they're trying to get past something that is made of ice. 
and they're flinging lightning at it, and they're flinging ice at it, and it doesn't work. And the game says, okay, this person's, they're just kind of stuck here. So I'm going to give them a little hint. I'm going to say you should throw fire at that, that, that wall of ice. And so they, so they do it. Um, you know, another kind of feedback, the, the other image that is there, that is essentially something, and I think the reason that I had that there is it's telling you whether or not you can wear that particular item based on a set of criteria, right? So that's a kind of feedback. And so somebody might not know that otherwise, but the system is saying you need more strength to be able to wear this. So uh, if you go to the next one there, Mitch. So in the classroom, I've seen, you know, there's a couple of different things that came to mind about how to implement this kind of thing. So giving students a mix of immediate and delayed feedback, that's kind of obvious. I said that in the beginning. Um, you can have them assess themselves or have them assess each other, which is interesting. That's, you know, one of the things you ask teachers to give people immediate feedback, but, you know, a single person when there's 25 or 30 students in a room doesn't scale very well. So having them maybe give each other feedback or assess themselves, that's immediate feedback and that, that, that does scale a little better. Um, and maybe also anticipate stumbling points and then already have feedback ready. So Mitch had kind of alluded to this earlier where if you can anticipate where people are going to be as they progress through something, if you know that there are going to be a handful of people that like mess up a particular thing or drop off at a certain point, already have that feedback waiting there for them. So it's just, it's right there when they need it. And it's not something that you have to like, you know, you know, act on when you see it or something like that. Just figure out a way that, you know, if they're, if they're in that particular situation, you're like, oh, I got you. Here's, here's this, here's this piece of thing that'll, this hint that'll, that'll help you out or something like that. So, uh, so, so that was it for this principle. Uh, Mitch, we can switch back to the to the stage and see if anybody has any comments or questions or anything. Sure. So, if people can raise their hands, if you want to come to the stage or type something into the AM window. Um, so, I'm, I'm trying to think of uh, if I weren't designing a game, if I was just doing this analog in my classroom. You know, how? Uh, what are the, some of the ways that I could? construct feedback similar to the way you would in a in game design yeah I think as I said earlier it's difficult to do immediate feedback in a classroom because you would have to you know game systems are self-aware right there they know what's going on at all times um, teachers don't have that luxury mm -hmm. so I mean I think one of the things that you could do uh, that games do a good job of because, uh, and I should say that games are not perfect systems. I mean, there are entire other, there are entire websites and organizations and, and stuff that uh, are designed to help players play games better by offering them training. Or a lot of times what happens is players will help other players. So there are sites that are, there's repositories essentially of people uh, sharing their, sharing their knowledge, sharing their information. That can be a discussion board, that can be whatever. So, and that, that's the kind of thing that can live on. Mm -hmm. So if you have one cohort of students and they have some tips and tricks and things they learn and they could leave that and it's almost like a, you're, you're leaving a message in a bottle, right? And then they, they go on, but then the next group of students comes mm -hmm. through, they could use that information, right? And contribute to it themselves. So there's like there, I mean, like I said, there, there are wiki pages after wiki pages. Every game out there has a wiki dedicated to it and it's just player contributed knowledge, mm -hmm. player, player strategies, player ideas it's but you know so i think that's something that would be interesting like essentially having like a wiki for your class that you might get feed but you mm -hmm. might get you might get a piece of information from a student that graduated years ago but it's still there because they might tell you an interesting strategy that they use to solve this project or something and that's something that we don't usually capture mm -hmm. that a lot in in school so that that would be interesting so i guess you know one way that I'm thinking of is when students display or when when students display their work on the walls of the classroom or outside the classroom is almost like a way of giving feedback or you know because obviously their work is they have to reach a certain stage for their work to be considered high enough quality to be displayed correct you know so it's it's kind yeah. of a way um, and then I'm thinking also there are games uh, Though some people wouldn't call them games, but things like Kahoot, uh, where um, class or classes are basically answering quiz questions in a game-like format, and they could yeah. even form teams, I guess, to to do that. Yeah, yeah, and um, I think would, that yeah would I mean, be other Kahoot ways. 
Kahoot is like a, it's a simple kind of I guess game like environment, but but I think that what you had mentioned mm-hmm. there about being in groups, about stuff like that, like that's all part of that experience too, right? Working on you know, and I, and I should have this should be one of this should have been in my goal slide. Goals don't have to be individual. Goals can be shared goals or group goals. Um, and, and feedback could be feedback for an entire class, right? Or they could be fle- feedback for a group. Mm-hmm. And I think thinking about things and structuring that way is, is interesting too. And I mean, I, I think a lot of classrooms do that sort of thing now. Um, mm-hmm. but, but yeah. So I don't And think then you mentioned, no. you know, hints was... No, and hints was part of this also. So I was thinking, you know, if you're giving a medium term or even a long term assignment and you know where students are likely to fall into traps, you can construct hints and you, that, you know, you could say, hey, if you run into traps, here's where you can find hints. And if you don't need these hints, you don't have to come to them. You don't have to go to this place to, to look for the hints. So that'd be kind of another way of yeah. providing a feedback mechanism. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of there's a lot of games that uh, now um, like the, the and the, the attendees probably won't know these names, but like so there's there's a series of games called Dark Souls and Demon Souls. Actually, they might be one of the one of the slides coming up. They have an interesting thing where when a player dies, they can leave a note to another player to let them know what killed them. So if you step up into a room and if you see a pool of blood and a ghost, if you click on it, it's a message from that last person saying. I died here because there's a dragon there. And so interesting stuff like that, like it's almost like, a, like an automated tip system, like a hint system. And you can either choose to click on that or not, but the information is there and it's a way for, sh- it's a way for mm-hmm. players to kind of share their, their experience, which is kind of, kind of interesting. I probably don't have a lot of dragon attacks in the classroom, but there might be. An so you could, you could really use that in the classroom because when you have feedback about how a student could have done something better or how a student didn't do something that um, progressed them. And, you know, it could be math, it could be science, it could be writing. Mm-hmm. You could then have the student leave a tip for the next student on how to avoid getting that, falling into that trap. Yeah, absolutely. How to learn. And, and, and that's, that is, that, think about how much knowledge is lost every time a cohort of students goes to the next grade. And uh, like, so, so being able to access all of that. I mean, it's like, you know, uh, I, I think younger siblings. So I was in, I was in uh, the oldest of, of, of my of, of the siblings in my family. I didn't have anybody to ask about stuff. The younger siblings were able to be like, hey, what was this grade like? Or what was this class like? And you um, told them? Sometimes. Um, <laughs> but I think, I, I, I think that it reminds me of that. It's almost like you, you have literally like an, you know, hundreds or thousands of, of older siblings that you could ask. It's like asking future mm-hmm. you, hey, how was this thing? Or, or you know, maybe it's the other direction. It, it's, you know, you me helping past me, you know. So it's kind of mm-hmm. an interesting way to think about it. So, yeah, Miss, you want to, we can uh, just finish up the last okay. thing and then, and then uh, we'll, I'm trying to be mindful of the time here. That's, yeah, I, I was just looking at that also. Okay, let me bring up your slides. I'll just keep talking. We'll be here all night. I won't stop, so. Cool. So the, the final principle that I wanted to talk about is challenge. Um, and so I, I don't know that I have to define the term um, challenge, although I think that in games we think about challenge differently um, maybe than, than, than someone would in education. So the, the idea of challenge is you want to keep the player not stressed out and not bored, but challenged. That is, that's, that's, that's a flow state, right? So if you have them constantly pinging back and forth between I'm totally stressed out and on board. That that sweet spot in there is challenge, and you want to you you want to constantly. So games are constantly adjusting their difficulty level, the difficulty scales in the short term and in the long term to keep people just engaged all the time. And and, and the next question is, what does it accomplish? And for me, the biggest thing is engagement, right? If you're if you're stressed out because it's too difficult, you're going to be like, nope. And if you're bored, then you're not going to be there. But that sweet spot that makes people continue on. Right, and then it gets even better if you have goals that that you're striving for. So, like, if you're challenged and you're you're going for those goals, then you know that that's absolutely perfect. And if you're getting good feedback, then that that is how you induce a flow state, um, which was the the first bullet point down there. So, so that is a flow is a term um, that there was uh, came out of some research in the '70s, and I I won't uh, try to say the guy's name. It's like Michaeli Chick sent me high or something like that. 
Um, but so, yeah, that's a flow state. That is the idea that if you if you have this graph and it's um, you know on the bottom, think of it as like player ability or time, and and like the player like kind of stress level, I guess. And you have like I'm super freaking out at the top, and I'm kind of bored here. That is that is a flow state, right? And so you want to keep things uh, in terms of like the pacing and the scaling, like you don't want to drop somebody into experience and they just get completely crushed. Right. And then they come back and they're crushed. Right. So like, that's not fun, but you also don't want to go into something and just be like, you know, totally unchallenged. Nothing is difficult. You're just, you know, mowing things down, answering questions. Everything's easy. That gets boring too. Oftentimes you hear in classrooms about certain students that are maybe advanced students, they get bored and it's because they're not being challenged. Right. So, um, uh, and then the final point is uh, they make, make difficulty level known and adjustable. So if you're going to have things be challenging, um, it's important to let people know what level of challenge they are currently at. If they're struggling, maybe you can dial it back if they're so making those things apparent to the player. And you definitely want to be aware of those as either the teacher or the administrator or the, or the, the designer, um, because you, you want to you want to have those. Uh, those increments of challenge, which oftentimes would match up with the increments of the levels that we talked about at the last principle, uh, you want to make those very apparent. Uh, so, Mitch, we'll go to the next uh, next slide there. So, well, there. So, so that uh, that that would have been easier instead of me trying to describe flow with my hands. Uh, there's a slide uh, if anybody wants to see it. So, on the bottom part there, it's essentially player ability or their skills. And then the challenge of the actual thing, right? So it's low to high. And I think I misspoke earlier. And I, I it's, it's, so it's challenge and, and their skills. And, and I, I say it's over time because if you think about it, somebody's skills progress as they progress through a system. Um, and then, yeah, it, it's that anxiety versus boredom. And that is the flow channel. So that's from a, another Gama Sutra article. Um, so we can go to the next one, Mitch. Um, and, and so... Here's two examples from games where the challenge is just cranked up to like 11 and players love it and that's perfectly okay, right? And that's because the players are aware that this game, and I believe the one on the left is Super Meat Boy and the one on the right is Bloodborne. And I think that's part of the, uh, the, the Demon Souls, Dark Souls series that I was talking about. I think Bloodborne is the third one. These games are punishingly difficult. You will die hundreds and hundreds of times playing these games. It's not like... It's not like Mario Brothers where you can just like kind of go through and it's like you'll die. Like as soon as something you, you just – actually it is kind of like Mario Brothers in that if something hits you, uh, a lot of times like you're just – you're basically dead unless you have like a mushroom, right? So – but they're incredibly punishing. I mean if you look at the one in the lower left like Super Meat Boy, you have to jump that little dude around that room that's full of like blades. And if you touch one, you just explode, right? So like that, those are very, very challenging, very difficult games. But you let the players know and that's okay. Uh, Mitch, we'll go to the next one. And so, so here's an example of, of uh, and somebody mentioned Candy Crush earlier, that lower right picture there is Candy Crush. Um, I said about making the levels and the challenge, the challenge uh, visible and, and, and very apparent. Um, so like in the, the upper one there, that's Diablo 3, right? And in Diablo, there are one through 10 levels of torment and you can decide which one you want to go into. Um, and so one is very easy, 10 is very hard, and it's a bunch of increments in between. And as a player, you have to say, I think I'm ready for this. Um, and Candy Crush is kind of the same way if you think about the way that players progress through the system. Each, uh, each one of those things is a little bit more difficult by design, right? Diablo is more math difficult because they just, you could scale, you could scale the Diablo difficulty with a spreadsheet. Uh, whereas the Candy Crush, they, it's new puzzles, it's new items, it's things like that. So Mitch, we'll go to the next one. And so finally, I wanted to share this one because it's the, the Mario Brothers example. This is actually not Mario Brothers. This is a new thing called Mario Maker. So Mario Maker lets people make their own challenge. It lets them make their own levels, which is kind of an interesting concept. So like I said earlier that you have students that are like either, you know, they're not feeling challenged, they're not feeling engaged, letting them design things. So in Mario Maker, you can go in and you can make, you can make your own Mario levels. And gamers essentially try to make things that are really tough. And then you get credit for beating the tougher ones that fewer people have beaten, uh, which is kind of cool. It's an interesting concept. Um, so I wanted to put that in there as well because it's nice to try to figure out a way to have challenge beyond what you intended maybe even in your original design. So uh, Mitch, we'll go to the next one there. And then so 
how to scale it, I talked about this before, mathematically, that's like Diablo, that's like more dudes, dudes hit harder, right? That's math, uh, by design. So that's in like Candy Crush, they design uh, more difficult levels as you go through because the puzzles are different, they're harder puzzles, or by adding new mechanics and rules. So a lot of times when the player learns a set of mechanics or a set of rules, then you add, add additional stuff and it makes it more difficult as they go through. Uh, we'll go to the next one, Mitch. And then finally in the classroom, so a lot of times when we do learning objective stuff or we're, we're, we're planning out a curriculum, we follow a taxonomy. If you think about scaling difficulty, it kind of matches with stuff like Bloom's taxonomy and like Marzano's taxonomy, right? Where you're talking about levels of learning and, and, and levels of assessment, but it is kind of a difficulty scale too. Um, having lessons build one on top of one another is great. You definitely want to do that anyway, but uh, that, that's a way to think about it is, is adding challenge. Um, and then incorporating extra challenge at the end of units or the end of modules. So maybe students who get to a particular point and they're like, I'm bored now, they have other stuff that they can do. So, um, and I think that's it. Uh, we'll go to the next one, Mitch, for principles and slides and stuff. So we can pop back to the stage and see if anybody has any uh, thoughts or comments or anything. We're a little over time, but but not bad. No, that's pretty good. And, and I think that was the last slide because I was trying to advance and it, it didn't really advance. Uh, so, you know, I was trying to think, so again, if you're, if you're a teacher and you're not using video games, the, um, the idea, the idea of that mathematical, you know, more things, it's like what you don't create, you don't create a challenge by putting more problems on a worksheet, right? So how do you, how do you mathematically increase the problem in a classroom? How do you think you would do that? Um, are you asking me, the participants? Yeah. I'll answer. Um, so, yeah, I, yeah I, th I think you're right. Like, you, you, don't, you definitely don't want to throw more stuff at somebody that's not getting it. I mean, that works in a game like, that works in a game like Diablo because that's one of the ways that, you know, if you're, you know, the point of it is you're a character and you're just, like, hitting, hitting bad guys, right? And or or even worse. Yeah, or even worse, a, a, a kid, go, a student, one of your students goes through and they complete the worksheet. You don't just give them another worksheet and say, hey, you can do more problems. Yeah. <laughs> That's so not would, challenging. I add, yeah, I would advocate that you, the, the second two things that we talked about, that, that difficulty by designing more difficult challenges and more difficult puzzles or mm -hmm. adding new mechanics and rules, right? So, you know, if you're doing math problems, okay, they did a certain set of math problems, but that was with Earth's gravity. Now do it with Mars gravity, right? So then like that's, you've changed the rules, right. you've changed the mechanics, right? So now you have to mm -hmm. figure out, well, you know, gravity on Earth accelerates at what, 32 feet per second per second or whatever it is. So like, well, that's different on Mars, right? So that's a way to add challenge or you can add, you know, additional, you know, and there are a lot of puzzle games in particular that do a very good job of that. If you look at games like Portal, if anybody's teaching mm -hmm. physics, Portal is a good one to look at, right? So you know, Portal right. adds additional mechanics and new stuff as you progress through. They're not throwing more stuff at you necessarily. They're throwing more complicated stuff at you, which is which is different. And I was also thinking, let's say in, in English language arts in the ELA, you know, maybe one way of doing something of of a project for the student is they're going to do something and then they're going to create, they're going to just write a paragraph or two to describe it. But maybe a uh, a a, a more challenging thing would be to write a poem, and maybe a more challenging thing would be to put it into a story, and maybe even the, the most challenging thing would be to write a play. And if they wrote a play, maybe they'd have the chance to perform their play in front of the classroom, run the play um, in front of their parents or something, so there'd be kind of built-in rewards to it. That'd be another yeah. way of, of increasing the challenge for people who wanted to rise to it. I, that was, what do you think of that? Yeah, no, I, I think that, because uh, you can see that all these things are kind of like, we keep reusing these same three terms because they're all very related, right? You add additional goals, which are more challenging. In order for somebody to do that, then you have to be able to give them, you know, kind of feedback along the way. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's lots of opportunities to do that. I think the, diff the difficulty that teachers run into is, I think adding challenge by by design or by coming up with it that's more work right like that's the one nice thing about you know mm -hmm. a game system where if we can increase difficulty mathematically that's easy to do much easier than somebody having to come up with right. additional projects or additional stuff so mm -hmm. i would advocate as often as possible mm -hmm. 
uh, letting the students come up with their own challenge. If somebody gets to a point and they're like, I've progressed through all the content that you've created for me, you know, it's not necessarily, I'm, I'm a big advocate of teachers being more, more facilitators than they are, you know, lecturers. So right. be a facilitator. Say, okay, the next project, you're, you have to come, come up with your own thing that you want to do. And that's probably going to engage that person mm -hmm. much more than, than some challenge you would have come up with anyway. So. Right. Yeah, and Patrick said portfolio. Well, so, so yeah. Oh, great idea, Pat. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I didn't see that, but I'm glad that you caught it. So uh, if, um, if people have questions, again, put them into the IM or comments, put them into the IM. Um, you know, I get, it, it was really interesting because I was thinking going into this that you were going to be talking about game design, but really what we're talking about is using game design principles any teacher can use in his or her class whether or not they're designing a, a game, but it's principles that game designers use to motivate uh, players. You can use those same principles to motivate students. Yeah, because it's all, they're, they're very universal. Like I could have totally, we could have done game design 101, but I don't know how often teachers are going to be designing games in the classroom or if they have time to do that necessarily. And I think uh, given the time that we had, I think, Talking about these universal principles Unless you're Steve and how Isaacs. they're in games, like, so, I'm sorry, Mitch. Unless you're Steve Isaacs. Yeah. Steve, you're going to see him at, at games at uh, Serious Play Conference because he's also oh, talking. Okay. Gotcha. Um, but so, so yeah, I think uh, I, I hope everybody uh, found this stuff to be uh, to, to, to be useful. Uh, it's de definitely uh, definitely th those three principles are not the only ones that you should think about, but they're kind of the uh, three of the bigger ones for me anyway. And I, I think that over time, there a lot of people are going to be accessing this because I can see um, you know teachers colleges and there's a number of teacher colleges who use these videos that this is really. A, a basis for for teach you know pre-service teachers to start understanding you know how to uh, different ways of students and copying the way game designers who have proven to be motivational are are doing that with their players. So I th this was this is great. Thank you, and um, and I hope to see you uh, soon at the Serious Play Conference. Uh, it was I think it's July twenty fifth to twenty sixth in North Carolina, uh, yep. right down by Chapel you, Hill. Chapel Hill. Okay, so um, do you have a, a last less pearls of wisdom? I don't know if I have any pearls of wisdom. I would say if you want to learn more about this stuff, probably the best thing that you can do rather than listen to someone like me is play games. Play, play any game you can get your hands on or watch other people play games. That, everything I know, I learned from playing games. I didn't, I didn't go to school for game design. I just play a lot of games and, and, wow. and make them. So. Play games. That's that's probably the best way to learn about this stuff. And most of your students are probably playing them anyway. So if nothing else, you know what what they're talking about. So. Right. Okay. Great advice. Okay, uh, Lucas. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks. Bye bye. Okay. And this is uh, Mitch Weisberg. I'm signing off for EdChat Interactive. I hope to see you all next week. We actually, I, I think we have three sessions next and a session the following week. So uh, see you soon. Bye.